Welcome to Magna Carta 2022. The Magna Carta 2022 is nothing but a prelims polity crash course for the upcoming 2022 prelims exam. We are now going to be studying the legislature and the executive of both the centre and the states comparatively and simultaneously. We will of course have a lot more focus on the central legislatures and the central executive because historically the prelims has always asked questions more on the central legislature and the central executives obviously because it is an all India services exam. Now we have divided this phase into two different lectures. In lecture number 6.1 I am going to be covering the President and the Governor and the Central and the State Council of Ministers. I must fairly warn you that we will do the President in a lot more detail than the Governor because it is more relevant and there are greater chances of questions being asked and we will study the Central and the State Council of Ministers in a very very uh, dedicated but a very very discretionary fashion where we will only study what is absolutely relevant and not get into unnecessary technical details which are not to be asked in the exam. As far as lecture number 6.2 is concerned, we will study the parliament and the state legislatures but we will have a lot more focus on the procedures and the functions and the processes of the parliament because historically this is where most of your questions are asked from. And we will close lecture number 6.2 on a basic and a brief discussion on certain thematic terms such as a parliamentary form of government, a cabinet form of government, a parliamentary executive and so on and so forth because these are also the kind of questions that are asked. Now before you start watching this lecture, in case you haven't done so already, please make sure that you watch lecture number 1.2 properly. And in lecture number 1.2, there are three specific topics that you have to cover to the best of your ability. Topic number one, the electoral matrix. This electoral matrix topic in lecture number two will give you an understanding of what some terms mean. For example, a proportional representation, single transferable vote, first past the post system. You must watch that from lecture number 1.2 because we are going to be using those terms to understand the election processes of some of the offices and institutions mentioned here. The second topic that you must do from lecture number 1.2 is majorities because we are going to be applying those majorities to certain processes and functions of these offices. And third and yet most importantly, you must be very thorough with the four golden rules that I have clearly taught in lecture number 1.2. The four golden rules are A. Democratic mandate, B. Federal balance, C. Separation of powers and D. Checks and balances. Please make sure that you have gone through these three things from lecture number 1.2 before you start with lecture number 6.1. Now let's begin. The best way to begin this is to visualize the functioning of the legislature and the executive or generally the government as a whole. We understand that the president is at the helm of affairs and the president interacts with the legislature, the executive and to a limited extent the judiciary. The whole discussion is about the nature of these interactions. Some interactions will flow from the president and some interactions will flow towards the president. So how we are going to study this is from a top to bottom perspective. We will understand the president. We understand that the president is a part of the parliament. We will understand that the parliament comprises of the president, the, the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. We will then take a magnifying glass, understand the composition, the structure and the functions of both of these houses. We will then understand the presiding officers for both of these houses and then we will further understand the members and their role in both of these houses. We will not be studying the Vice President of India in lecture number 6.1 uh, but we will be studying the Vice President of India in lecture number 6.2 because the Vice President primarily functions as the chairperson of the Rajya Sabha. So that would be a more appropriate time to understand the domains of the Vice President of India.
right now similarly the president is a part of the executive the executive comprises of the prime minister and the council of ministers and the central cabinet is nothing but a subset of the council of ministers so we are going to be following a top to bottom approach similarly and parallelly the governor also has a similar ecosystem at the regional level the only difference is that the governor for the states and the lieutenant governor for union territories and also union territories with legislative assemblies will also become points of interaction with the honorable president of india wherein some interactions will flow from the governor to the president and some will flow from the president to the governor and we will examine such kind of interactions through a constitutional lens so this is our broad understanding in fact the president therefore becomes a common entity for the legislature the executive and the judiciary and the same actually goes for the governor now let us start with the president and the governor the president primarily is an elected office and the governor primarily is an appointed office which means the role played by the president is functionally larger than the role played by the governor because there is a democratic mandate in the office of the president now we also understand that the president is the head of the central executive and this means that the president will therefore have a certain degree of magnanimity towards it let's quickly understand the basic principles of elections and removal of the president we'll compare it to the governor and then we will take a magnifying glass and understand the the presidential election in a lot more detail right so as we were saying that the president is an elected office and the election to the president is conducted by the election commission of india and while the constitution provides for a basic framework a basic set of provisional guidelines mentioned in the articles of the constitution it is also supported by a dedicated central law called the president and the vice presidential elections act of 1952 this act provides the technical details to the provisions which are mentioned in the constitution with respect to the elections of the president as well as the vice president but it is fairly clear that the election of the president is conducted and managed by the election commission of india which in fact is a constitutional body now the president fundamentally is indirectly elected which means you and i as ordinary citizens do not play any role in the election to the president of india this is justified because india is a parliamentary democracy wherein the president really has nominal powers the president fundamentally has negligible powers and the real powers lie with the council of ministers so therefore it is okay for the people to not directly participate in the election to the president nonetheless it is a parliamentary system so there must be some mandate to the election of the president and that is why the representatives chosen by the people which are basically your mlas and mps they participate in choosing the next president of india and the next president of india is going to be chosen in 2022 which is why this topic becomes incredibly important as far as the prelims is concerned right so it is indirect elections because the representatives in the form of mps and mlas who are chosen by the citizens are going to participate in the next election to the president and this process of an indirect election is governed by three very simple principles first proportional representation second a value vote system and third that you require more than 50% of the total number of votes that has that have been cast in the election of the president this is unlike how your mps and mlas are usually directly elected now again for the sake of brevity please make sure that you watch lecture number 1.2 to understand the appropriate meaning of proportional representation and a value vote system the basic layman understanding is that all votes are not equal in a proportional representation format and therefore some votes will have to be given a higher priority 
which means some votes will have to be counted more than once. And in, if, if banks are to money, democracy is to population, so areas which have larger populations, their votes will be counted more number of times. This is called the value vote system. Right? So these are the basic principles. And this is the basic framework from how the president is elected. Now, so we understand that it is an indirect election which means it is going to be conducted by a dedicated electorate or an electoral college. This electoral college will comprise of the Lok Sabha, the Rajya Sabha, the State Legislative Assembly and the Union Territories which have Legislative Assemblies. There are three Union Territories which have Legislative Assemblies, Delhi, Pondicherry and JNK. If any of them do not have a functional assembly, then that particular territory or that particular state shall not participate in that round of an election. Alright? Now, so it is very clear that the center as well as the states are going to participate in the election to the president, which means both the center and the states are going to play a role in electing the president of India. The question is why? Because the president has been given a certain amount of role in the sense that the president can impose a presidential rule, thereby shutting down a state legislature. And for that to happen, the president must legitimately be in charge. So the president gets the authority to impose a presidential rule on a state because somewhere foundationally those very states have also participated in the election of the same office which is the president. So that is the constitutional reason as to why the states also participate in the election to the president. The second important dimension is that only and only elected members of the houses participate, nominated members do not participate. Now let us understand why. Because nominated members do not enjoy the democratic mandate as elected members do. Therefore, by the application of the rule number one of our golden rules that we studied in lecture number 1.2, we understand that if you want to go and elect the first citizen of the country, you yourself must have been elected in the first place. Through a recent constitutional amendment, going forward, we do not have nominated members in any of the lower houses of the center of this or the states. So the Lok Sabha and the assemblies do not have any nominated members anymore. But the Rajya Sabha still has nominated members which are constitutionally provided for. So, nominated members will not participate in the presidential election because nominated members do not have the democratic mandate. The third understanding here is that state legislative councils, which are the second houses in a select few states, do not participate in the election of the president. The state legislative councils do not participate in a presidential election primarily because they are not uniform. Every state does not have a state legislative council. And if every state does not have a state legislative council, it would be unfair to the rest of the states because the states that have a legislative council will tend to bring more votes to the table simply because they have two houses instead of one and therefore to maintain uniformity at least at the level of the states the state legislative councils are not allowed to participate in a presidential election and anybody who's contesting to be a president must be a citizen of 35 years of age and must be must be eligible to contest a lok sabha election now in india remarkably the system of citizenship that we have is that it does not matter how you become an Indian citizen. As long as you are an Indian citizen, irrespective of the way you become an Indian citizen, 
it means you could have been an Indian citizen by birth, descent, naturalization or registration. It does not matter. As long as you're an Indian citizen, you're as much as an Indian citizen as everybody else is. There is no discrimination on the basis of the way through which you became an Indian citizen. Right? So therefore, as long as you're an Indian citizen, that's all that counts. Second is, you've got to be minimum of 35 years of age. Now, there is a very interesting arithmetic progression in this. If you see, the minimum age for a Lok Sabha election or a lower house election is 25. The minimum age for an upper house election is 30. And the minimum age to become the president or the governor for that matter is 35. So 25, 30 and 35 demonstrate what is called an arithmetic progression, which is basically uh, there's a difference of five, a difference of five years. Now, in a democracy, what does five years represent? In a democracy, five years represents the ordinary cycle of the Lok Sabha through which the government comes into existence. Now, the youngest Rajya Sabha member will have seen five years of the country in action, a government in action, more than the youngest Lok Sabha member. It does not mean that the person would have been a part of the government, not at all. It simply means by the fact that you are five years older than the youngest Lok Sabha member, you have five years more of observation of the kind of work any government has done. So that makes you the house of elders. And who's elder than the house of elders is the president, which is where the youngest president would have seen at least five years more than the youngest Rajya Sabha MP and 10 years than the youngest Lok Sabha MP, thereby providing a sense of maturity, assuming but not admitting, to the president's office. And the third qualification, which is rather peculiar to the president's office, is that the president should be eligible to contest a Lok Sabha election, minus the age, because the age uh, is now being countered with 35. So what else does make one eligible to contest a Lok Sabha election? You should be a registered voter in any constituency. And of course, you should be in compliance with your electoral laws, such as the Representation of People's Act. But the real question is, why does the president need to be eligible to contest a Lok Sabha election? Primarily because, if you think about it, the president is the one who formally issues the orders to dissolve the Lok Sabha, who also has extraordinary powers impacting other legislatures in the country through emergency provisions. And therefore, the least you should do is that you should be competent enough to be able to have contested a Lok Sabha election if you wanted to. Whether it is an ordinance power, whether it is the powers to dissolve a house, whether it is the powers to impose emergency anywhere, these all have legislative implications. These are all democratically obtrusive powers. Now, if you're going to be exercising powers which have a democratic and a legislative implication, then the least that should happen is that you should be eligible to contest the election to the lower and the largest democratic house of the country, which is of course the Lok Sabha. So this is why your eligibility conditions are such. And the person who administers the oath to the president after the president has won the election is the Chief Justice of India. Now, why the Chief Justice of India? Because everybody else, whether it is in the legislature or the executive, is a political office. And the president, by law, is the only office at the centre which by law has to be apolitical. The president cannot have any formal association or membership of any political party or any political organisation during the tenure of the president. Now, because India is a parliamentary system, it does not matter how often does the president get to re-elect and, and become the president again, because the president is undoubtedly going to have negligible powers.
the president is going to be bound by the advice of the council of ministers and the council of ministers are going to be coming from a party which has a majority in the lok sabha and anybody can recontest an election and come back to power any number of times in the lok sabha so if there cannot be any restriction on a political party to bring majority again in the next election there cannot be any restriction for the president to be reelected again primarily because the president has a negligible role and owes its existence to the advice of the council of ministers who owe their existence to the majority party of the lok sabha and in a parliamentary system because the president has negligible powers it does not matter in a presidential system uh, like the us it would but in a parliamentary system like india it does not right so this is the process now once we are clear with this we must now also look at the broad terms the broad understanding of how do you remove the president now we use a special word for the removal of the president and that is called impeachment now what is that supposed to mean first things first the impeachment of the president happens only and only through the parliament the states do not play any role whatsoever in the removal of the president so the lok sabha and the rajya sabha are the only two houses which are participating in the removal or the impeachment of the president now if you compare it to this the states participate in the election of the president but the states do not participate in the removal of the president why is that the case this is nothing but an application of rule number 2 where this was the hollow candy given to the states because the president has the powers to shut down state legislatures through the process of a state emergency or a presidential rule as it is formally called and anyways the rajya sabha is a representation of state will so it is supposed to exercise its vote in the interest of what is in the best interest of the states and that is why the states are not given any role in the impeachment there is a very practical example of this for example let us say there is state a and there is state b both of them have the same regional party x which has formed government now due to certain conditions the president has imposed presidential rule in state a this may be debated this may be controversial the same regional party also has government in state b they can initiate an impeachment motion against the president if the states had a role to play thereby by sort of hampering the entire process and the integrity of the impeachment process but what is very interesting to notice only and only elected members participate in the election to the president whereas both elected and nominated members participate in the removal of the president now why is that the case it's because the grounds are such the grounds to remove the president are certainly very very vague they are called the violation of the constitution now technically anything under the sun could be a violation of the constitution there will be an event x conducted by the president on an action x conducted by the president which could be considered as a violation of the constitution right now <clears throat> you will have to figure out whether that event x actually happened and whether that event x is a violation of the constitution or not so when you are figuring out whether that event x actually happened it is called the question of fact and does the event x actually violate the constitution or not is called a question of law and whenever you are examining these two questions it becomes at least a quasi judicial process so the removal of the president is actually a quasi judicial process if the process is quasi judicial then you don't have to worry about the democratic mandate because you are not looking at democratic reasons to remove the president you will require a democratic majority but not democratic reasons to remove the president and the toughest majority that there is which is more than 2/3 of the total strength of either of the of both of the houses is required both the lok sabha and the rajya sabha have to demonstrate this majority 
and at the same time they cannot sit together and this impeachment process can be, can begin either in the lok sabha or the rajya sabha there is no hard and fast rule in and around this so this is the logic behind this this is exactly how it works a simple application of rule number 1 and rule number 2 now if you compare it to the president uh, if you compare the president to the governor the governor seems to have a more uh, have a relatively more uh, streamlined and a, and a relatively simpler process as we said before the primary difference between the governor and the president is that the governor is an appointed office whereas the president is an elected office so who is appointing the governor the governor is appointed by the president this is a simple application of rule number 2 center stronger than the states but because india is a parliamentary system the president has negligible powers the president will appoint the governor on the binding advice of the council of ministers now through several years it has been understood that this process of the governor being appointed by the president on the advice of the council of ministers has sometimes played out against state interests where the governors that have been appointed have been sometimes accused of being loyal to the center than being impartial so a convention of sort has been developed the convention is while the president is appointing the governor while the president is appointing the governor the president must also take the opinion or consult the concerned chief minister of the state now this is not mentioned under any law let alone the constitution it is just a standard practice it is just done so that the states feel valued like a hollow candy because the opinion of the chief minister is not binding on the president as far as the appointment of the governor is concerned you may get a question in the prelims where they will mention according to the constitution the president must consult the chief minister before the appointment of the governor and that would be wrong because it's nowhere in the constitution it is simply a matter of convention now Uh, as far as your eligibility is concerned because the governor is an appointed office there cannot be any democratic eligibility so therefore only a citizen and an age of 35 is more than enough and for the sake of brevity and logistical convenience we can't have the chief justice of india spending 30 40% of his or her time delivering oaths to so many governors of so many states and territories across the country so the respective high court chief justice will deliver the oath to the governor all right now uh, when it comes to the removal of the governor if you are an appointed office then you will be removed by the person who has appointed you so if you've been appointed by the president you will be removed by the president on the advice of the council of ministers however unlike the president there are absolutely no grounds which are mentioned because it is an appointed office because it is an appointed office and because it is an appointed office the governor will therefore serve during the pleasure of the president which is basically the pleasure of the council of ministers you will never see any grounds for somebody who is fundamentally appointed as far as these the legislature and the executive is concerned right so this is how it is done now all we have to do is take a magnifying glass and understand the presidential election in a fairly logical manner and understand the presidential election in a mathematical manner right so let us begin and let's understand how does this actually happen in actual reality all right so let us begin as far as the presidential election is concerned we understand that the president is elected indirectly we understand that the president is elected indirectly there are no two doubts about it now interestingly if the president is elected indirectly there have to be a there has to be a principle behind this the principle is that the president must be elected indirectly by the common man now let us understand the implication of this so that our process becomes easier let us say there are two classrooms classroom a and classroom b if you notice classroom a is bigger in size will have more number of people 
but classroom A will not have the kind of doubt solving capabilities like classroom B would have, right? That's a fundamental difference. Whereas classroom B is smaller in size and will have lesser number of people, but there will be a, a better doubt solving ability between the teacher and the students. Now, if you look at it carefully, classroom A represents an MP constituency and classroom B represents an MLA constituency. In a given state, the number of MP constituencies may be lesser than MLA constituencies, but the size of an MP constituency is always bigger and will have more number of people in an MP constituency. Whereas in an MLA constituency, the size will be smaller and in a given state, you will have more MLA constituencies, but with lesser number of people in it, but with lesser number of people in it. So for the common person, for the common man, for the ordinary citizen, the MLA constituency becomes a more intimate form of a democratic representation. It is what the ordinary citizen will feel closest to because it's smaller and you can directly talk to your MLA in a better capacity than you could possibly talk to your MP. And this becomes the foundation of the presidential election. Very simply, we calculate MLA votes for the states, then we calculate MLA votes for the center, then we total them up and whoever gets more than 50% of this total number is declared the president of India, right? Now, I will give you exactly 30 seconds. You can get your calculators with you and in about barely 5 to 10 minutes, we will do a live presidential election right in front of you so that you will never ever forget it and it's actually simpler. As far as the prelims exam is concerned, you do not have to memorize under any conditions the formulas that are given as far as presidential elections are concerned, right? So you can take 30 seconds and then we will continue. Just take 30 seconds and I will get my uh, numbers also. All right. Okay. Are we ready? Sure. So let's begin. We start our journey from the states. Then we keep the states as a base to calculate center. And then we will move to totaling it up. We've understood that only and only elected MLAs of state and union territories with legislative assemblies shall participate. Approximately, we've got 4,120 MLAs who are going to participate. And if you watch the lecture number 1.2, you will remember that for all, all election bases, we've kept 1976 as the base year for population. This is on the basis of the 1976 census that the number of seats to the Lok Sabha have been decided and so on and so forth, right? So let's continue and let's sort this out and let's get this part clear. All right. This is nothing but a simple application of a unitary method. What we're going to do is we are going to first calculate the, we're going to first calculate the number of times the vote of an MLA of one specific state will be counted. Then we will, we will be calculating the total number of votes or the total votes that are going to come from that specific state. For example, if a state has five MLAs and each vote has to be counted twice, then the total votes coming from that state is 10. This is basically the match that has to be done. Just this and nothing else, all right? Once we've done this for all the states, once you've done this for one state, we will do the similar exercise for all the states. 
and then we will have the total number of votes that have come from the states. It's honestly that simple. So let's begin. The basic understanding is if you have to calculate the number of times the, the vote of each MLA of that specific state has to be counted, it's basic unitary method, the population of the state, the population of the state divided by the total number of MLAs and because this is going to be a, a numerically very heavy figure, we just divide this by 1000 and that's the number that you're going to get, which means larger the population of the state, more number of times will the MLA vote be counted and therefore more votes will come from that state. Let's do a simple understanding. Let's do simple maths, right? Now, let's say for example, Arunachal Pradesh, right? Now, in Arunachal Pradesh, the population of Arunachal Pradesh as per 1976 is 467511, okay? Is 467511. And Arunachal Pradesh has 60 MLAs. You divide it by a further 1000, which means each MLA's vote in Arunachal Pradesh is going to be counted eight times. So total votes that are going to come from Arunachal Pradesh is nothing but the total MLA's which is 60 into each vote counted eight times that is 480. So we're going to have 480 votes coming from Arunachal Pradesh. If I give you the other end of the spectrum, our beloved state called Uttar Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh's population is 8384995. This is the population of Uttar Pradesh as per the 1976 census, 8384995. When your population sounds like your phone number, that means there is something to worry about. And Uttar Pradesh, as we know, has 403 MLAs. You divide this number by a thousand up and you round off uh, 0.5 and beyond, you will understand that each MLA's vote in Uttar Pradesh is going to be counted 208 times. 208. That means the total votes that are going to come from Uttar Pradesh is 408, uh, three, 403 MLAs and each MLA is vote counted 208 times and that is 83,824. We just have 480 votes from Arunachal Pradesh but 83,824 votes coming from Uttar Pradesh. And this is the exercise that you have to do for all states and union territories with legislatures. So that is how 4,120 MLAs, now each vote will be counted different number of times and that is the basis of proportional representation. These 4,120 MLAs represent, representing a population of approximately 54 crores, 55 crores in 1976 and the total votes that are going to come out of these 4,120 MLAs is approximately 5.5 lakhs which is 5,49,495. So in a presidential election, all the states and union territories with legislatures combined are going to give you 5,49,495 votes. And these votes will then become the base for you to calculate the number of times the vote of an MP should be counted. Ideally, this should be the population of India of 1976, 54 crores or 55 crores. But the problem here is, if you do this, then what is the point of taking a st state population or state-wise population into account? So, the, when you have to calculate the number of times the vote of an MP has to be counted, that means we will take the total state value as the base. So. 5,49,495 becomes the value on the basis of which an MP's vote will be calculated. So the number of times an MP's vote will be counted in a presidential election is actually based on the total amount of MLA votes in a presidential election. That is the beauty of democracy. That is how we try to integrate federalism in the country. Okay. 
So 5,49,495. And the total number of elected MPs would be 543 in the Lok Sabha, 233 in the Rajya Sabha. That makes it 776. So you've got 776 elected MPs and 4,120 uh, elected MLAs who actually totally participate in a presidential election. So this actually becomes 708, you can check this. So each MP's vote is actually calculated 708 times. Center stronger than the states. Because the highest number of times an MLA's vote is counted is UP because they have the largest population which is 208. Which is why in the prelims that they had asked you, the value of an MP's vote in a presidential election is always more than an MLA's vote. And the value of MP, whether it's a Lok Sabha or the Rajya Sabha, is the same. 708. Each elected MP's vote will be calculated, will be counted 708 times. So therefore, what are the total votes coming from the, from the center? You've got 776 MPs and each vote is going to be counted 708 times. And this figure again comes very close to 5.5 lakhs, which is 5,49,408. So we've got 5.5 lakh votes from the MLAs. We've got five and a half lakh votes approximately from the MPs. So the total votes that are being cast, the total number of votes from 4,120 MLAs and 776 MPs is approximately 11 lakhs, five and a half lakhs here and five and a half lakhs here. It's basically uh, 5,49,495 plus uh, 5,49,408 and this is approximately 10,98,903 uh, votes. So in a presidential election, a total of approximately 11 lakh votes are polled. And whoever gets more than 50% of these approximately 11 lakh votes wins. That's the presidential election for you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, when you start counting these votes, if it is very clear that one person is getting more than 50%, great, close, that person is declared the president. And it has only been once in the history of the country, only and only once in the history of the country, that we've required a second counting of votes. Because if let us say there were four people contesting, it was only once that one person did not get more than 50% in the first round of counting. Only once. In 99% of the cases, we very clearly knew that one person got more than 50% of the votes. Which is why you have a single transferable voting system. Which is simply, if no one gets more than 50% in the first round of voting, then the person with the least votes gets eliminated and the next preference of the person who got the least vote share, that gets added up. So give you a simple example. Let us say there are four candidates, A, B, C, D, and let us say a total of 10 votes have been polled. So you need six votes to win. Let us say A got four, B got three, C got two, and D got one. You take out the one vote that D had got, one vote that D got. Now, in that, there will be a preference. Obviously, D has been given the first preference. That is why the vote has been given here. We have to eliminate D because D has a negligible, negligible chance of winning the election. <coughs> <coughs> because enough people do not want D as their first preference. Then we will see the person who is given D as the first preference. Who has the person given as their second preference? Let us assume it is A. So we cancel out D and the one vote that D got, we add it to A. So now A has five votes, B has three votes and C has two votes. Still nobody has six votes. Now you will eliminate C. You will take out the two votes that C got as their first preference. Right? C got first preference here, C got first preference here, the two votes that C has gotten. 
in one of the votes a was given the second preference in one of the votes b was given the second preference so you add one vote to a and one vote to b while b now has four votes a has six votes c has been eliminated but b has been declared the winner this second round of counting has only happened once in the history of the country only happened once in the comment box you can let me know who the president was although it is irrelevant as far as the prelims is concerned so that is why the presidential election becomes a fairly interesting and a very very uh, complicated but an important process right clear so this is how it is done the value of an mla vote is always lesser than the value of an mp vote the value of a lok sabha mp and a rajya sabha mp's vote is the same the election starts from the states keeps the states as the base but eventually the center overpass the state and this is what is called a presidential election right now that we are done the rest of it is very simple we simply have to compare and contrast the powers of the president and the governor as we were discussing in the beginning of our lecture there is an interaction that the president has with the organs or the branches of the government right now the president has some interactions with the parliament the president has some interactions with the council of ministers now both of these interactions are two ways for example the parliament can send not can has to but the parliament will send bills which are basically legislative proposals passed by the parliament not yet assented by the president bills to the president and the president will then assent the bill and then the bill will become a law the president also sometimes plays a role in house procedures which we will discuss in detail such as dissolving a house proroguing a house calling a joint sitting motion of thanks there are certain house procedures that the president follows and sometimes there are certain reports that the president through the office gets tabled or laid on the floor of the parliament and all of this happens because of powers in the union and the concurrent list similarly the president is the person making appointments as the president is the head of the executive and in return the president also receives constitutionally binding advice from the council of ministers and this could be advice on literally anything whether it could be an ordinance whether it could be whether somebody's sentence has to be pardoned off whether somebody's death penalty has to be pardoned off whether a presidential order has to be released and so on and so forth now this is how the president interacts with the parliament and interacts with the council of ministers similarly the governor also does the same the only difference is especially in the advent of the emergency during the 42nd amendment 1976 it was a constitutional amendment which said that the president is constitutionally bound by the advice of the council of ministers whereas no such provision for the governor exists because the governor would be given some form of discretion in some manner right the basic ground rule is the basic ground rule is that there is no time limit for the president or the governor no time limit for the president or the governor uh, to let us say take a decision and in most cases in most cases there are a very few exceptions where the president can return or send back the advice absolutely for example the collegium for uh, supreme court appointment recommends a name the president receives it the council of ministers says we don't like this name the president can send the 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 recommendation of the collegium back or for example let us say the council of ministers have drafted let us say an ordinance sent to the president the president can send the ordinance back for reconsideration but you can only return once why because rule number 1 the democratic mandate if the parliament is there with the parliament if not then the council of ministers because they have been chosen through parliamentary will this is the basic understanding the basic ground rule is there is no time limit to act on anything and in most cases the president can return once 
the general options that are available with the president and the governor is you can accept you can reject or you can return now it is from here that your specific provisions come into play like for example the concept of veto is on is from bills and assent ordinances come from here because the parliament is absent right suppose it is the uh, a, a, for example it is a death penalty it comes from the judiciary side so everything essentially comes through this tunnel and and the 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 regulating factor the guiding force is for the president the union list and the concurrent list and for the governor the state list and the concurrent list so for example the president can pardon anything which is a union list or a concurrent list subject and the governor can do so if it's a state and a concurrent list exception being death penalty which we'll come to later similarly the president can issue an ordinance on anything which is in the union list or the concurrent list because the democratic power originates from the union list and the concurrent list the parliament can make a law only on the union and the concurrent list so then the president can also issue an ordinance only on a union and a concurrent list there is no match behind it right so this is how it works and this is the larger ecosystem now we simply have to look at some of the special cases let us say veto the ground rule is if you've returned once and it has come back to you you have to say yes so second time is the charm but let's understand this veto is nothing but a legislative uh, negative it's a legislative negative the legislature has passed a bill sent it to the president or the governor now the president or the governor can either accept it great sign it and then it becomes a law or can say no it ends can return for reconsideration or can reserve it's that simple and there is a very simple way to go about this your standard books can often be wrong on this so you have to be very careful with your understanding the president can reject can say no can end that bill and can end any bill except a constitutional amendment because if the president could end a constitutional amendment it would undermine the power of the parliament to amend the constitution which is specifically given in the constitution under 368 that would violate rule number 1 which is democratic mandate so can the president president reject a money bill yes but can the president reject a constitutional amendment bill no you have to say yes as soon as possible right whereas as far as returning is concerned the president can return any bill except a constitutional amendment bill in a constitutional amendment bill the president has no choice but to say a yes you don't have any other choice how long does it take for you to say a yes is is circumstantial but you have to say yes you can't even reject it because again it would undermine the authority of the parliament under 368 to amend the constitution similarly you cannot return a money bill you must understand why because a money bill primarily and this is important the money bill has been introduced with a presidential recommendation can only and only introduce be introduced in the lok sabha and the lok sabha has overriding powers over the rajya sabha as far as the money bill is concerned right now if the president is returning the money bill you are effectively undermining the authority of the lok sabha which is where your democratic intent lies you are undermining the majority of the lower house who has the authority to decide on financial matters so you cannot return it because it would be infructuous they'll come back to you with the same process the council of ministers are from a majority from the lok sabha you return it back they'll come back to you you have to report it to the lok sabha they will again pass it they will override the rajya sabha it'll be back to square one why the rajya sabha has lesser powers than the lok sabha is nothing but a matter of rule number 2 center stronger than the states and we'll come to that in our in in, in the in, in lecture 6.2 but it would be infructuous it would be logistically inconvenient why would you do this because you'll be, you'll be back on square one 
सो यू कैन नॉट रिटर्न अ मनी बिल यू कैन रिजेक्ट अ मनी बिल एंड बिकॉज देर इज नो हायर अथॉरिटी देन द प्रेसिडेंट देर इज नथिंग दैट यू कैन रिजर्व नाउ इफ यू कंपेयर इट टू द गवर्नर राइट इफ यू कंपेयर इट टू द गवर्नर द क्वेश्चन ऑफ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल अमेंडमेंट्स डोंट इवन अराइज एट द लेवल ऑफ द स्टेट्स even those constitutional amendments which require state ratification after the parliament has passed it it is directly sent to the state legislatures and they get back to the parliament directly the governor plays no role here so there is no question of constitutional amendments with respect to the governor because the governor has no role in constitutional amendments however there is something special that is that the governor can reject any bill except a bill which is being passed by the state legislatures which alters the powers of the state high court like for example law and order is a state subject for example uh, ipc is concurrent list so what if the state legislature of a state pass a law where it reduces the power of the high court to let us say hear a specific type of a criminal matter so you are reducing that high court's power now we understand that we have an integrated judicial system and the collegium is centrally appointing supreme court and high court judges and the high court judges and the supreme court judges are both removed by the parliament so if you are undermining the authority of the state high court then you are undermining the authority of the center which is the center stronger than the states so that is why when a bill is passed by the state legislature which is changing the power of the state high court positively negatively doesn't matter that bill compulsorily has to be reserved for the president you don't have any other choice you don't have any other choice you have to compulsorily reserve it for the president it is beyond your doing that's it what the president does now the president can then uh, reject return and so on and so forth that is fine but has to be compulsorily reserved for the president as far as returning is concerned the same money bill argument will apply here also so the governor can return any bill except a money bill because again it will it will be back to square one and any other bill which uh, alters the powers of the high court because it has to be reserved for the president right now as far as reserving is concerned this is where the governor gets a little bit of a special treatment as i said before any bill which reserves the power which changes the powers of the respective high court of the state passed by the legislature the governor will straight up send it to the president that's clear and the governor has a constitutional discretion that the governor can can decide can think of any bill of any bill that the governor likes that the governor deems fit that this should be assented by the boss then you can reserve any bill for the assent of the president this is the constitutional discretion slightly slightly putting governor slightly over and above the president right and of course center stronger than the states because the governor will never act against the interest of the center because the center appoints the governor right this is more than enough for the prelims honestly you don't need anything else now when we look at ordinances there's a simple application of rule number 2 ordinances are nothing but temporary laws which are issued by the president or the governor in the absence of the legislature because there has been an urgency of some sort that is it that is all what an ordinance is they have similar powers presidential ordinance powers in 1 2 3 and governors in 2 1 3 subject matter you can the president can in, can can promulgate an ordinance on a union list and a concurrent list the state uh, the governor can promulgate an ordinance on the state list and the concurrent list there is constitutionally no restriction on the promulgation of ordinances there have been several supreme court judges which uh, supreme court judgments which have had certain uh, uh, sort of mechanisms devised on re promulgation of ordinances on the same subject matter and so on and so forth or or they have to necessarily be taken to the legislature but that is something you don't have to worry about as far as the pre is concerned right now a constitutional amendment cannot be passed as an ordinance why because a constitutional amendment comes into power through constituent power 
which is not the same thing as ordinary law and that is why it cannot be used or executed through an ordinance the conditions are the same either or both of the houses are not in session because you require both houses of the parliament to pass any law it is a common misconception that people think the rajya sabha doesn't vote on the budget of course it does the budget is nothing but an aggravated form of a money bill the rajya sabha will pass the budget because if not the lok sabha will override the rajya sabha but the rajya sabha will always pass the budget every bill there is not a single bill in the country which can only be passed by the lok sabha and not the rajya sabha every bill that has to be passed by the parliament has to be passed by both the houses so even if one of them are not in session then the bill can't be passed and therefore a situation of urgency can arise theek hai similarly at the level of the states as far as the governor is concerned uh, either the legislature or the council uh, both are not in session that's also okay most states only have a legislative assembly right now usually it is the council of ministers or the cabinet which uh, draws up the bill and sends it to the president now important an ordinance is a law an ordinance is a law under article 13 clause 2 which means it cannot violate a fundamental right and therefore can be judicially reviewed an ordinance is nothing but an executive advice given by the council of minister which is legislative in nature so of course can be rejected or returned and because an ordinance is a temporary law rule number 1 democratic mandate the real power lies in the hands of the parliament to pass a law it will only have a limited time frame which is why it has to be passed within 6 weeks of the next session's first sitting and the maximum gap between two sessions of the houses can be 6 months so the maximum gap an ordinance can have is 6 months plus the 6 weeks from the first sitting Uh, from the first sitting of the next session these are your basic common points so this is what is called an ordinance these are your basic provisions you don't need anything else as far as your prelims is concerned now if you quickly compare as far as discretion is concerned the governor certainly has more discretion because the governor can reserve any bill for the president and can suggest the president's uh, rule to the president under 356 and both of this has been constitutionally mandated situational discretion such as the president and the governor can invite according to their whims and fancies whoever is a suitable leader in case we don't have a clear majority they have the same this is a situational uh, discretion and when this discretion is exercised it is nothing but which is uh, it's a political discretion when there is no council of ministers then of course they get to decide who should become the pm and therefore the rest of the story continues so the governor definitely has more constitutional discretion than the president this is again center stronger than the states because the governor is still appointed by the president on the advice of the council of ministers from a judicial point of view it is in fact the president who appoints both supreme court and high court judges the oath can be given separately that is okay but the appointment is done by the president through a nationalized process which is called a collegium and the president is the only person who can pardon a death penalty the governor can't there's also a reason behind this because death penalties have to be confirmed by the high courts of the respective states and the high courts are the highest judicial organs of the states and law and order is a state subject which is why checks and balances we have to get it executed through a central authority uh, in case we have to get it checked which would be the president that is why the president gets the powers uh, to pardon a death penalty because after the case has been exhausted through multiple layers of appellate authority right from the lower courts to the high courts to the supreme court and so on and so forth the only person who's left is the president of a commensurate seniority so this is why and honestly this is more than enough if there is a question that will come you will be able to answer this through a simple logical framework and your reading list is very simple chapter number 17 of of lakshmikanth for president and chapter number 30 for governor you read the entire chapter once and only focus on these headings qualifications terms powers and functions veto ordinance and pardoning 
and very importantly do 17 number 2 table and here you should do table number 31, 30.1, 30.2 and 30.3. This is more than enough. You don't really need to do the NCRT for this topic because the questions that are asked are fairly procedural from here. And this is your basic reading list. Right? Now, you should look at Council of Ministers. Just this much is more than enough. Don't read anything else as far as Council of Ministers is concerned. The basic understanding is, the Council of Ministers is your elected executive. A subset of it is the cabinet because it's logistically difficult for the Council of Ministers to meet uh, every week and to get everybody together because of the varying nature of their jobs. So therefore the cabinet is nothing but a smaller subset of the Council of Ministers. And therefore you have certain cabinet committees such as cabinet committee of appointments on parliamentary affairs on economic affairs and so on and so forth who take key decisions on behalf of the Council of Ministers. As far as the constitution is concerned, the term cabinet is only used once and that is only used in the context of the central cabinet whose recommendation is needed for the imposition of a national emergency. State cabinet is nowhere mentioned in the constitution, right? Now, of course, the Prime Minister as the head of the Council of Ministers is constitutionally obligated to keep the President informed of the developments in the government. Similar case with the Governor also. And after the anti-defection amendment, uh, the 91st amendment of 2003, which made some changes to our defection provisions, we have a limit of the total number of Council of Ministers. Because otherwise, people are defecting from opposition parties and coming to ruling parties with the lure of becoming what is called a, uh, a, a minister. So now the Council of Ministers cannot be more than 15% of the strength of the Lok Sabha cannot be more than 15% of the strength of the Lok Sabha, right? This is the maximum. And of course, the cabinet will obviously be a smaller subset of this 15%. This will not be more than 70, 80 ministers at the center. Now, uh, very important. The prime minister is appointed by the president. The other ministers are appointed by the president on the advice of the prime minister. You cannot do this without the prime minister's advice. If the Prime Minister resigns, the Council of Ministers automatically resign. But if any of the other ministers resign, it does not mean that the Prime Minister resigns or the rest of the Council of Ministers resign. And it does not mean that the Lok Sabha is being dissolved. The Lok Sabha can only be dissolved through a presidential order if either they tell the President that we've lost confidence or a no confidence motion has been passed in the Lok Sabha or the budget has failed or motion of thanks has failed. So any of those reasons. It just doesn't, it doesn't, the Lok Sabha doesn't get dissolved just because the, pres, the, pres, the Prime Minister has resigned or unfortunately has died. Okay. As far as collective responsibility is concerned, checks and balances, the Council of Ministers are collectively responsible to Lok Sabha, rule number four, checks and balances not to the Rajya Sabha because that would mean the states also have a role in the political stability at the center and therefore would violate rule number two, uh, federal balance. And the ministers are individually responsible to the PM. So the PM can ask any minister to resign, can ask the president to remove any minister, that is okay. And just because you've been removed as a minister does not mean that you have been removed as an MP. But if you have been removed as an MP, then you would also be removed as the minister. The, res the reverse is true, but this is not true, right? Because the 91st Amendment made it very clear that if you've been disqualified on defection, then any other public office that you would hold, you would also lose. It's exactly the same here. The only difference is the word cabinet does not find mention in the constitution. And there is a bare minimum limit to the number of ministers at the state, which is 12. And of course, there are some specialized restrictions that you should have a tribal welfare minister in certain states where tribal welfare is a priority. Please don't do anything else beyond this. It is absolutely not needed. This is more than enough. Apply your basic logic and you will never ever go wrong. Because the, length, the life of the country is the life of the lower house. If nothing is happening to the lower house, then why would the Prime Minister's designation or death impact the Lok Sabha? When Indira Gandhi was assassinated, Lok Sabha was not dissolved. You had to re-choose your minister, that is fine. 
but that did not mean the Lok Sabha was dissolved. Right? So remember this, always correlate it to circumstances in and around you. I will put this in the reading list also, there are three, four pages in the Lakshmi Kant, both the editions have the same. But even if you don't go through it, just this much is enough. You don't have to worry too much about it. Don't do the compositions of the cabinet committees also. They're not going to ask you this because cabinet committees are fundamentally intra-political executive bodies. So this covers the executive. We'll now move to the legislature. Thank you.